Gin. Sure, our guest speaker this evening is quite an extraordinary person. I just found out that he graduated from high school when he was 13 years old. He graduated from college with his bachelor's degree when he was 17. And he went to university to do his master's degree twice but didn't actually finish, he dropped out and went on to start a business uh, which is dealing in data and uh, he has worked for different uh, presidential campaigns. He started actually working for the Obama campaign when he was 20 years old to help Obama get elected and then from there he's gone on to provide data services for almost every uh, Democratic campaign, presidential campaign that is actually all of the Democratic campaigns. Except for Tulsi Gabbard. So he's provided um, uh, data information for all of the presidential candidates that are currently in the race. And um, David has a lot of interesting things Just he's so going you know. to tell us. And I would ask that you please give him your attention as we give him the floor for the next few minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, it's unfortunately going to be a little longer than a few minutes. Okay. All right. So, you know, the first, I just. But, you know, this one graph over here uh, tells the story of 2016 pretty well. You know, the, basically every single dot on that is a county. The y-axis is the change in Democratic vote share from 2012 to 2016. And the x-axis is the percentage of people in that county with a college degree. And so what we can see is uh, almost 60, about 60% of the variance uh, in chain shift, we can be explained purely by education levels. Uh, the main story there being that places that were very highly educated swung toward Democrats, voted for Democrats at levels never before seen. And then the flip side is areas with low education levels voted, uh, swung tremendously toward Republicans. Uh, and unfortunately, there are a lot more of the latter places than the former. So just to show the Oh man, well, there is like a thing over there, but it's okay. Um, so just to show this same graph again, but a little zoomed in, uh, this is again 2016. One of these is the, is the same graph as before, showing education versus change in vote for the president, and the other is showing it for the Senate. And what you can see is in 2016, there wasn't much of a relationship for the Senate, there was for the president, so chances are this probably had to do with Donald Trump in some way. So the next thing uh, is that Nobody, uh, going into the election, uh, basically everybody thought Clinton was going to win, myself included. And, uh, you know, basically uh, Trump did much better than expected in almost every state, but particularly in states in the Midwest uh, with lower education levels, places like Missouri or Ohio or Maine. And so the question is, why did that happen? 
Why is it that uh, no, we went, nobody saw this coming, uh, nobody saw that Trump was going to win, and nobody saw that these places were going to swing against Democrats? So the first thing uh, was this theory that maybe Trump mobilized all of these voters, that you know he talked in a way that no one ever did before and brought out people who had never voted before. Maybe there was low Democratic enthusiasm, maybe that's why there were those changes. And so it turns out, uh, I guess since all of you are related to campaigns, whether or not you vote is a matter of public record. So in the months after 2016, we were able to track who voted and who didn't vote. And it turns out that actually uh, most of the changes, most of the election result changes uh, were due to changes in people's mind and not really changes in the electorate. If anything, the electorate was actually slightly democratic in 2016 than uh, 2012. And so this is a graph which, again, I guess the uh, Axes aren't ideal, but I'll try to explain it. So every single one of these lines is a state, and the basic idea is that for every state, you can decompose a change into changes in who voted and changes in how people voted. And so, you know, there's a couple things jump out. Like, obviously, uh, we did much better than expected in Utah, you know, partly uh, because people in Utah don't, you know, like Donald Trump, but also partly because Mitt Romney wasn't on the ballot at that time. Uh, you can see Oregon, it's, you definitely wouldn't know this unless I pointed it out, so I'm just gonna go. So that green thing over there that I tried to go, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, no, I, no, I promise, I won't do that again. But uh, that, uh, that's Oregon. So Oregon's the only state in the country that saw a substantial increase in, in the percentage of the electorate that were Democrats, and that's because they, packed, they passed automatic voter registration, which is a, which is a great idea. Uh, so, and then on a sadder note, uh, roughly speaking over... Here, we see this big decline, one of the largest declines in turnout in the country. That was Wisconsin, which passed photo ID laws. Uh, and so that's, that's very bad. Uh, and so, still, basically the green bars show change in turnout, and the purple bars show people changing their mind. And so the big story of 2016 was people changing their mind. You know, in the cities, you had people who had been voting Republican for decades, uh, who changed their mind, and then in these rural areas, you have, you'd had counties that, you know, Elliott County in Kentucky, for example, had voted Democratic in every single presidential election going back to the 1870s, and Clinton got, I think, I think like 25% of the vote there, or something ridiculous like that. So there are a bunch of places like that. And uh, so then the question is, okay, all these people changed their mind, but why didn't the polls see it coming? And so, you know, the next, uh, you know, basically, if it wasn't turnout, uh, why is it that pollsters got it wrong? And, you know, the answer is it's going to be that survey takers are really incredibly weird. Uh, that's a big part of my job, is that uh, normal people don't, don't take surveys. Uh, but so it goes, back, it goes back to this concept uh, that sociologists like to talk about called social trust. Uh, Putnam wrote a book about it, Bowling Alone. Uh, and uh, so the way the government tracks this concept of social trust, there's this survey they do every two years called the General Social <laughs> Survey. They spend about $3 million to interview like 2,000 people, so it's very expensive, and they get an 80% response rate, which means that we can really get a read on what people think. And so the question they have is, do you think that people can generally be trusted, or do you think that people should keep to themselves? And so the first thing is that when they started asking this question in the 70s, it was around 60%, and now it's around 35%. It's, since we've been per, uh, surveying it since 2017, we've seen it drop by about a point and a half per year, and that, that just seems bad. But uh, from a technical perspective, why does this matter? It turns out that uh, you know, people who say that people can be trusted, that's uh, those two bars over there swung heavily toward Democrats, even when you control for education. So those two bars, college educated people who trust their neighbors, non-college educated people who trust their neighbors. We did much better with those people. Even though we see this education divide, you know, it wasn't really about education. It just happens to be that trust levels happen to be different, you know, on average between educational groups. And the group of people who don't trust their neighbors, they swung heavily toward Republicans. And I think that that's kind of unsurprising. You know, 20, 2012 was a referendum in a lot of ways about, you know, whether or not you want universal health care. 2016 was a referendum on whether or not you think, you know, people can be trusted, whether or not you trust the system, whether or not you trust institutions. So that's all well and good. But from a pollster pulse perspective, it just turns out that technically, and maybe this is unsurprising, people who trust their neighbors are way more likely to answer phone surveys. 
Uh, which, <laughs> it's like a real, it makes sense. That's a real thing, though. And so basically, all of us were coming into 2016 looking at polls of these people, and we were very excited. And then those people uh, actually turned out and voted. And that's like the short story of uh, you know, why that actually happened. That's, we've done a lot of research on it. We think that and not turn out, not shy Trump, uh, really was just that survey takers are pretty weird and it's very hard to adjust for these things. So just to break this down another way, because um, there's a lot of ways you can cut this, whether it's education or trust. This is a, a matrix showing uh, 2012 and 2016 vote by attitudes on issues. So, you know, this column over here is attitudes on universal health care. That one is amnesty. And so you can see is that Obama, you know, contrary to a lot of narratives, actually did really well with racist white people. You know, he got 60%. Uh, he got uh, better, better with, you know, he did better with racist white people in the Midwest than, you know, any Democrat since, I guess, Carter. And that's, that's why he won. Uh, but anyway, so you can see that he got these cross-pressure voters, people who support universal health care, oppose amnesty. Obama got 60% of those voters. And Clinton got 41. Uh, and so that, I think there's a real point here. Um, you know, a lot of people like to psychoanalyze Trump. Uh, but, you know, since we're all here in Europe, you know, we can see that really Trump, 2016 was about issues. You know, Trump took a particular set of issues that he was going to be centrist on, he claimed he was going to be centrist on economic issues, and that he was going to be anti-immigration. And uh, voters responded to that. The voters who swung toward us were people who opposed, you know, who supported amnesty, the voter, voters who came against us. Uh, were the ones who were against it. And there's a real point, which is that issues actually matter. I think sometimes in politics we get a little too cynical about these things, but actually voters have real issues, it changes real issue positions, it changes who they vote for. And that's really relevant because, you know, what we see over here, this is a graph, the Wesleyan Project, they went back and hand-coded every presidential ad, you know, in the last uh, 20 years. And so traditionally, Democrats, uh, about 70, 80 percent of their ads would be about issues. And Donald Trump, you know, followed that trend. He actually ran an incredibly issue-focused campaign. Uh, but Hillary Clinton ran fewer issue-based ads than any president in history, uh, or at least in the last 20 years. And the reason it makes sense was, uh, you know, I, there was a lot of material to work with against Trump, but there's another point, which is that she was, the way she was picking, you know, what her ad should be about, what, uh, you know, what messages she should run her campaign on, was surveys. And the people she was surveying were these high trust people who were disgusted by Donald Trump, who thought that you know this election was more important, you know, than the particulars of healthcare, uh, and she, you know, changed her mind accordingly. And it's like kind of a dull, almost unsatisfying theory of the universe. That, you know, why did Hillary Clinton end up running the campaign she did? And it's because polls pointed her in the wrong direction, and it's an underrated reason why Donald Trump is president. Uh, and so that's why it's pretty important to get measurement right. So. Moving to some broader context. Uh, this is a graph that I like a lot. I think it actually explains a lot about the world. So education levels, uh, this is just showing education, educational attainment over time. So what you can see is that right after World War II, 70% of the uh, population didn't even have a high school degree. Only 4% of the electorate uh, had a college degree. And you know, as we move on, at this point, 40% of likely voters, uh, or nearly 40%, have a college degree. And so, as that's happened, you know, both in the U.S. and in the U.K. and in France, and if you made a graph like this for Germany, it would look pretty similar. College educated, you know, as the college educated share of the electorate has risen, center left parties have tried to appeal to college educated voters. And so, what this graph is showing, again, it's you know, it's not super clear. So, this is showing the the gap between college educated voters and non college educated voters by party by year. And so, in the immediate post war era college educated voters were substantially more conservative than non-college educated voters. This is back when the center left, you know, was the party of working class and labor unions and class struggle and all of these things. And so what you can see is that, you know, there are uh, fits and starts, but for the most part, there's been this steady linear trend upward of, uh, you know, college educated voters swing toward the left and, you know, non-college educated voters who used to, you know, used to be in leftist strongholds, whether it's, you know, whether it's the, you know, uh, Saarland or West Virginia or Liverpool, it's all like, you know, basically uh, they've been trending toward the right. And, you know, that last little blip, the yellow blip over there, that's actually uh, 2017 with Corbyn, 2019 is 
even higher. And in the context of the US, you can see this blue line shoot up that Obama actually did a very good job of depolarizing, uh, depolarizing elections by race and keeping, the, uh, keeping things on you know, about economic issues. And then 2016 you know, represented this giant explosion in the you know, college, non-college gap. So uh, another way to look at this, just in terms of the changing, uh, the changing predictors of vote, this is showing a couple of uh, racially charged incidents that happened over the, course of, uh, over the course of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. I actually didn't know about this prior to, uh, it's before my time, the goat shootings, but it, it involved, there was someone who was mugged on a subway and then he attacked with his muggers. Uh, but what you can see is that back, back then, there was actually very small partisan gaps on racial, racial issues. Uh, it used to be that there were plenty of racist Democrats and plenty of reasonably woke Republicans. It used to be that there was basically no relationship between what you thought about, you know, O.J. Simpson or racial justice or immigration and how you actually voted. And so you move forward to today or this decade and suddenly these gaps are enormous. And so this stops, you know, that's pre-Trump. And if we did this now, it'd be even higher. You know, we moved from having zero, a 0% zero gap or a 10% gap to, uh, you know, Democrats being 60 or 70% more liberal than Republicans on racial issues. So, from there. Uh, the other thing, you know, the other thing that's worth remembering is that actually this, this divergence uh, has mainly been driven by the left. Uh, it's not that Republicans have gotten more shitty or more racist. They're actually roughly as shitty as they've always been. And that's the <laughs> There's a real point here, which is that in 2006, Democrats were also really bad. So this is a graph showing uh, what percentage of people say that immigrants today strengthened the country because of their hard work and talents. And you know, this is a really liberal room, but when I'm saying this in the US, it's like, oh, all you Democrats, you were all fairly racist 10 years ago. It's true, but if you look at the studies, uh, everyone's kind of retconning, but Democrats are now much, much more liberal on these issues than they were before. And uh, this is, why the salience of these things has gone up. And so it's really interesting. You know, this is a graph showing immigration, le immigration levels uh, over time, sorry, polling support for immigration over time. And so you ask people, do you think immigration should be higher, lower, or about the same? Obviously, if you ever give uh, survey takers a middle option, they usually take it. That's like one of the rules. You always want to have an even number uh, of things. But it used to be that increasing immigration levels polled at like seven or six or seven percent, it was literally less popular than legalizing heroin uh, until uh, very recently. And so, you know, now we're at a point for the first time in history where increasing and decreasing immigration is roughly at the same level of support. So these cosmopolitan attitudes are actually substantially more popular than they've ever been at any point in history. Uh, but in the wrong places. So this is a graph, uh, this is a graph showing uh, relative presidential liens in Ohio and Texas. And so going up to 2016, you know, Ohio has been a swing state really for the last, uh, I guess, 50 years. I mean, honestly, for the last 150 years. And, but Texas for most of the last 30 years wasn't. And suddenly, as you see over there, there was this massive realignment, you know, where place, uh, Demo Voters, college-educated voters in places like Texas or California or New York massively trended toward Democrats, but it didn't change anything. Uh, meanwhile, in all of the places that we needed to win, Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, we saw much larger trends against us. And, you know, that's, uh, turns out there's a lot of structural issues with American democracy, but that's for another, uh, later, later talk. All right, so next, uh, what happened in 2018? Much, uh, much brighter than 2016. Yeah. So the first thing, turnout went up by a lot. I think this is an underrated, weird thing about 2018. 2018 had the highest turnout of any midterm, literally ever, at least since 1974 when we started. Like, so that's really cool. But it turns out that Democratic and Republican turnout both skyrocketed. You know, it's this scary thing where. Uh, Political salience was up, but for every single liberal who was really mad at Trump, there really was this mirror conservative who was just as fired up and turned out. And so even though we saw an enormous number of electoral gains, we won all of these seats in the House, and we lost some seats in the Senate, not as many as we would have, uh, and it just turns out that 
Most of these, uh, n just like with 2016, roughly 90% of the, of the change in attitudes was due to changes in people voting and not in turnout. Because again, the turnout differential was, you know, the turnout increase was roughly, roughly evenly distributed by Democrats and Republicans. And so again, this is like the graph before. All of the, uh, the orange bars here are changes in turnout. Uh, and the yellow bars are people changing their mind. And so you can see in West Virginia, you know, Hillary Clinton got 27% of the vote in West Virginia, and Joe Manchin got 51%. That's not mobilization, you know, that's persuasion. And so just, you know, going, this is a table, oh no, some stuff's cut out, all, all, the, good, all the good stuff's cut out. Okay, well, so this is a, this, Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Hero. Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is a table showing uh, change in support by demographic groups uh, in uh, 2018, from 2016 to 2018. And so overall, you know, we did about three points better. Uh, you know, going from 51 to 54 really helps you win a lot of elections, even with our messed up maps. Uh, it was fairly even by gender, you know. Uh, but if you look. Uh, over here, most of the gains were with non-college educated whites. You know, the story of 2018 is that a very large fraction of these Obama-Trump voters came back and voted for Democrats this time. It's also good, yeah. Uh, and the flip side, on a darker note, I, again, I, I don't want, this, I don't want this, no, this talk to be too happy, uh, is that we, we did substantially, you know, we did substantially worse, especially in relative terms, with non-white voters in 2018. And that was true both in terms of turnout and support. And so 20, 2016, you know, was actually the first year from 1990 to 2016, every single election had seen the gap between white and non-white voters go up. And 2016 was actually the year where racial polarization went down. You know, whites trended toward, uh, trended toward white, uh, sorry, toward Democrats a bit, non-white voters trended toward Republicans. That trend continued in 2018, and it actually might continue in 2020. I think a lot of people in politics take non-white voters for granted, and there's a lot of indications we shouldn't be doing that. So, next, this is the second piece, which is, uh, this isn't as well known, but even though, uh, even though Democrats won in 2018, the polls were actually roughly as wrong if you go state by state as they were in 2016. So this graph over here, the x-axis is polling error in 2016, and the y-axis is polling error in 2018 using public polls. So what you can see is a pretty tight correlation. You know, the reality is that Public polls were wrong uh, in 2016, and this issue for why they were wrong, social trust, still largely hasn't been corrected for uh, using, you know, public po uh, public pollsters still haven't done that. And so you can look, I think it's, people get really excited, they see polls in Kansas where Trump approval is like minus one, and those aren't real. Uh, Kansas is, isn't gonna vote for us this time. I think it's really, if, you're, if you wanna look at state-by-state -state polls, you have to be very cautious. So, next, what about 2020? So the first thing, again, is not to be too optimistic about the future. Uh, so I think a lot of people uh, after 2018 thought, this is amazing, we're gonna win in a landslide, we're gonna wipe away Donald Trump. But the reality is that historically there's been no correlation between how, uh, how a party does in the midterm and how they do in the general. Ask President Romney or President Dole. Uh, this is like an important point. Uh, and so looking at it a different way, this is something called the state legislative index. And so what you can do is you can track, there's a bunch of state legislative special elections happening all the time. And this is a really good way to get a sense of the national mood. Obviously, those two dots over here, right after Trump, uh, think special elections were, we were winning election after election in all of these super Republican districts. And since then, since 2018, things have pointed to a pretty neutral environment. We lost a very important race in Wisconsin. A lot of, and, and you know, all, we won, uh, while we've won a couple uh, races, we've also, also lost you know, the House specials that have been there since then too. So another way to look at it, oh no, okay. So another way to look at this is uh, the way, right now if you look at head-to-head uh, -head polls, uh, we think this far out, it's much better to look at the economy and Trump approval. And so this is this, you know, here we have this matrix where this is GDP growth and that's presidential approval. And right now, you know, the economy is pretty good. GDP is at about 2%. And, uh, but the president is extremely unpopular, minus 12%. So this translates to us getting about 52% of the vote, which seems great. Yeah. The problem is that actually, we have a horrible electoral system. We need about 51.6% of the vote to win. So we are narrowly favored. You know, our models, we think that Democrats have about a 65% chance of winning the presidency. 
That's not very much. It's actually very close. You know, if you, this is our fancy modeling, but if you want to just look at public polls, this is just, if you Google RCP, Trump versus Biden, Biden plus four. Our win number is about 3.2. So uh, things are incredibly close. Yeah. Everyone should do everything they can. Uh, yeah. And that's why I'm glad everyone's here. So uh, next, I'm gonna talk about myself. I probably should have done this first. Um, hi everyone. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I work at Citizen Analytics. Uh, we came from the, the CAVE, uh, which was the analytics team in the Obama campaign. It was actually a funny story. Basically, the work we did was so secret. No one had ever actually done data science or modeling in campaigns before, but they locked, they locked us in a broom closet. Uh, basically, there were like 60 people packed in this room, and we went a little crazy. Uh, people would turn off the lights and put lasers on. That's me when I was much younger. Um, and uh, so then after that, basically, you know, we got money from some friendly tech billionaires to start a company. And so since then, uh, we basically work with almost every, uh, you know, I think almost every major presidential candidate, you know, the House, Senate, Governor, State Ledge. My work with, uh, you know, the DLCC for State Ledge is why I managed to get invited this time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just after 2016, we saw all these problems with social trust and all these other things and concluded that polling was fundamentally broken. And going into 2018, we couldn't afford to invest in the wrong districts and pick the wrong messages. So we totally built all of our polling from scratch. You know, we survey 2 million people a year, 100% of them online. And the big thing for us is that, you know, we don't just wait on the standard scientific, you know, on the standard polling demographics of age and race and, you know, gender and all of these simple things. You know, because the problem is that phone survey respondents are so weird now that you actually need to ask a lot more. So we ask indicators of racial resentment. We ask social trust, which I talked about. Talked about. We ask what major you went to college. We ask whether or not you traveled abroad. We statistically track. You know, we try to adjust for all of these things. And you know, in every single survey we do, we ask House and Senate, Governor, State Ledge, and we're in the field every single day. And then we make it available to campaigns using cool-looking dashboards, that look like that. And so, you know, uh, I guess those are some of our forecasts. We're pretty happy. I guess there's like a bunch of dots that are close to other dots. Doesn't come out as much there. But uh, you know. Going ahead to 2018, we ended up being roughly twice as accurate as Nate Silver. You know, we were able to call races, other people weren't. I guess we're good at polling. I'm going to stop tooting my own horn here. But uh, we also help people invest in the right states, and there's some cool stuff there. So the second piece, which I think is actually like a general interest, is that up until 2018, no one ever really scientifically tested ads. And you know, the reason is that historically, it was really hard. Um, you know, doing the way that people would generally do it is they'd get a focus group of six or seven, usually very strange people. They'd show them the ads and they'd ask them who they, you know, what they thought. And you know, the big problem with that is it turns out that people are really bad at figuring out, you know, what's persuasive and what's not. And then the other problem is that the people who you get for these things are pretty weird. And so after, after we built all of this methodology to statistically adjust for things, we also built out this apparatus so that we could uh, scalably and cheaply test ads. You know, we're at a point where if you're a presidential campaign and you want to test an advertisement in Iowa, you upload your four videos, and then we do an RCT, and then we give you guidance on whether it works within 24 hours for like six or seven thousand dollars. It's very cool. If you have any friends who run campaigns, you should tell them about this. But uh, more importantly than than that, I think uh, we tested over 200 ads in 2018, and 20% of them made people want to vote for Republicans, which is really bad. Uh, you know, if I have one. One simple theory of change is that we should test ads and then we should not show the ones that make people want to vote for the public. So our first client was uh, Doug Jones uh, in the Alabama Senate race, which is very cool. You know, I, it's, I probably won't get to win another race in Alabama in my lifetime, so it was cool to do that. Um, but uh, I think there was like a really interesting point about what did well and what didn't. Uh, when we went and we, not only did 20% of ads do well, but do badly, but when we would go and uh, survey the staff, every single time we did an ad, we had you know our staff actually go rate them. The more our staff liked the ads, the worse they did. <laughs> no, it's real. And the problem is that you know, the kind of people who work in politics, people like me, we don't have very much in common with swing voters. Yeah. And you know, like an example I like is, uh, you know, we, we went back and we tested the mirrors, Hillary Clinton's mirrors ad. It was the most shared uh, ad from 2016. A lot of engagement, a lot of likes. It was basically a woman, you know, this little girl standing in front of a mirror watching Donald Trump say horrible, horrible things. 
And uh, it turns out that that one made people, made, made sporadic, uh, persuadable voters uh, vote for Republicans, because persuadable voters are horrible. Uh, it's, a, it's a real lesson. Uh, and so anyway, uh, just to talk a little bit uh, about what kind of stuff does well, what kind of stuff doesn't, you know, we went and we've tested, uh, I think this is a summary of uh, about 40 different anti-Trump messages that, we, that we've tested. A lot of people really want to attack Trump. We're all very mad at Trump. We all dislike Trump. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of these voters that we're trying to win back who voted for Democrats their entire lives and saw Donald Trump speak and then said, oh, that, I want that. These, these people kind of like Trump. Uh, and so it turns out that a lot of, you know, something that we found is that talking about issues uh, is about three times more effective on average than personal attacks against Donald Trump. And that's not to say that Donald Trump isn't hurt by being an awful person. Uh, it's just that the media covers a lot of these awful things that he does from a personality perspective. The fact that he's a misogynist, the fact that he's you know, broken the law, the media talks about that a lot. But the media isn't gonna tell people that Donald Trump is polluting rivers or that uh, Democrats have a healthcare plan that could help working people. And so, but then if you wanna talk about issues, some issues do better than others. Uh, you know, obviously, talking about Medicare does really well, talking about, but, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people will look at this and it might look, people have this conception of, you know, progressive versus moderate. But something we've seen is that the most effective messages, some of them are progressive, some of them seem moderate, uh, but, you know, swing voters aren't super ideologically coherent. So, like, Social Security expansion, for example, that's one of Elizabeth Warren's policies. That would, would have been considered extremely radical six years ago. And it's the second best issue we've tested out of over 100. Uh, the flip side is that some, you know, there's other, th there's other things that don't even fit into that category where mental health is a pretty powerful issue. We're talking about cleaning up the air is a pretty powerful issue. But the flip side is that some things do less well, like an assault weapons ban or talking about the DREAM Act, and that's kind of an uncomfortable thing. And so uh, moving forward, uh, to just some stuff that you can all do. This was something that we were involved with in 2016 and we helped spin out to another org. Uh, this is an app called Vote With Me. I don't know if anyone here used it. Uh, so the basic idea is that you, it takes your phone contacts, it matches them to the voter file. It's very creepy. Uh, and then it, <laughs> oh. and uh, then it tells you, and then it goes and it looks at our scores and it tells you which of your friends are likely Democrats who live in swing districts and who, and who might not vote. So yeah, I just want to be clear, if you download this app, you can look up all of your friends and see whether or not they voted. Uh, this is a, uh, 100%. Yeah, so uh, you can do this. Uh, so it's a matter of public record. Uh, people are pulling out their phones now. Uh, yeah, uh, so something that was, this wouldn't be legal in Germany. I don't know if it there's, there's, a, there's a reason we did this. It's not, not just to enable creepiness. We've done, you know, it just turns out, it turns out that uh, field contacts, traditional field contacts, are really hampered by the fact that strangers bothering strangers who don't care about politics just doesn't work very well. Uh, and so we've done experiments, and it turns out that, you know, with this app specifically, we did one, but there's others like it. Uh, some, someone reaching out to someone they know is literally, you know, about six to eight times more effective than uh, someone reaching out to a stranger. And so, you know, this app, we got it, uh, about 300,000 people used it in 2018. So uh, Jimmy Kimmel uh, mentioned it on his show. But there are other apps like this. You know, the Buttigieg campaign actually is entirely relational now. Uh, and that's like kind of the future of, uh, kind of the future of organizing, I think. It's just like learning how to scalably harness people's networks. And so this is just like a practical bit of advice is, if you know anyone in the States, the most effective thing you could do, phone banking is great, you should do it. But even though it's a little more awkward, just going through and bugging some of your more irresponsible friends and reminding them to vote. Pretty, pretty simple, effective thing. So uh, that's about it. I just wanted to, so now it's just questions. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. So in 2016, you mentioned Nate Silver, but 538 was pretty accurate. They gave Hillary like a 65% chance, but the upshot gave her like a what, 97% chance? Uh, so, or whatever the New York Times polling was. So why was there such a huge discrepancy between those two? 
you know, both, both of them saw the same polling. Uh, Nate Silver has you know, been doing this for a long time, and he realized that polls can be wrong sometimes, and that's a really important lesson. I think a lot of people saw you know, Hillary leads of five points and thought, oh, there's no way that uh, we'll lose. Uh, it's the same thing with Brexit, where you know, Brexit had very, you know, the Remain team, the Remain side had very narrow polling leads, plus two, plus three, and the final result was totally reasonable given that. And I think it's just an important thing to prepare yourself that we shouldn't be overconfident. And this is like a real, like I was working in democratic politics in 2016, and there was a lot of cockiness, you know, like I think, you know, one of, there was a, one of our clients asked, instead of trying to win 270 votes, why don't we try to win 370 votes? And it's like, no, that's, it's very bad. Uh, we actually, we could lose. It'd be really bad if we lost. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's just a matter of being cognizant of how wrong uh, polls can be. But it's all very hard, it's partially because survey takers are very weird. Um, okay, I might have to. It might make sense to devolve passing this around. I don't, I don't get a ton. Of, I don't. I don't care too much about the word. Thank you. You'll get it right back here. Um, overseas, we have always been telling ourselves that we have an issue of turnout and not persuasion. That we just need to find the Americans and the, then they are going to vote with us because you can't be so stupid if you live outside the United States and experience other things. Um, is that true? How can you or people with your kind of smarts help us figure out, do we have a persuasion issue? What do Americans overseas care about? Can you help us? Because we don't know where they all are, but I think you've already probably heard that. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a great that's a great question. So I think that in a literal sense, as you're going about your life in, in uh, Europe, most. Uh, actually mostly Democrats, but I do think there's a real point, which is that uh, a lot of you know, uh, it's most, the problem here is mostly voter registration, and when I go through and I talk about mobiles, it, you know, when people go through and they try to say, what's the cheapest way to turn out, you know, to get votes? Uh, persuasion is very cost effective, and it actually is often much more cost effective than trying to get out sporadic voters, but the most cost effective thing you could do is voter registration. And that's like a really big part of what you all do over here. But the second piece is, you know, I think there's a real, we all exist in social networks. And so when we're going out and we're talking about things on Facebook in a way that people in the US could see, e even if 70% of our friends are Democrats, you know, the other 30% might surprise you. And so it's really important to talk about things online in the right way, in the right branding. Uh, and that's, that's like a big challenge that we're trying to figure out is how can we, you know, how can we channel effective messaging out to the grassroots so people can talk about things in the right way? Um, but also, uh, voter reg is the single most important thing, and so I think you're all doing great as far as that goes. The right way. Yeah, so, you know, in the graph before here, you could just see that there are, I think there's a real danger where the way that most messaging that gets communicated to activists and to volunteers is designed to raise money from them. You know, I like see this when I like work at firms where like, you know, like the D-trip is, uh, hasn't, like the reason why, uh, like the D-trip is always sending these emails with like, you know, capital letters and lower cases and it's designed to like emotionally rile us up uh, and extract as much money from us as we can. Oh, oh sorry, the D-triple C, they, they, uh, Sorry. Yeah, they they were they they're the committee that handles house stuff, and they if you get a, bun a bunch of fundraising, Democratic the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, they uh, if you get a bunch of fundraising emails, they send a bulk of them. And the main thing is that a lot of this messaging that we put out to volunteers and to fundraising is designed to extract you know money and to excite volunteers. You know the problem is that uh, we you know the problem we have. Donald Trump is really lucky. You know, Donald Trump, the people that he want, he wants to mobilize uh, are like racist white people. And the people he needs to persuade are racist white people. And the people he raises money from is also racist white people. But Democrats have a really hard problem. You know, the people we're raising money from, for the most part, are like affluent, educated people who live in cities. The people we're trying to mobilize are uh, young people of color. And the people that we're trying to persuade are racist white people. And so this three, 
and these three groups of people are super different, and the messages that appeal to them are super different. And you know, the problem I think is that we're picking a lot of a lot of the communication and a lot of the ways we talk about things ends up being the messages that raise the most money or do the best job at recruiting volunteers. And for but that means that for a large number of persuadable voters, that's the only content they're seeing, and that's like a that's a real worry. Yeah, that's the concern. So you know, uh, any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering if you take into consideration the landscape around the voting machines and all the different states and the different issues that they've had. And there's like a whole lot around that, but if you could talk a little bit. So, you know, the, the good news is that for the most part, when it comes to the literal counting of the voting machines, you know, that's something that I don't worry a ton about. You know, there's actually a lot of redundant systems to catch these things, not, not always, and like, there are activists who are really vigilant about this, and it's great. The bad news is that there's this totally different, uh, you know, thing that people talk about less. I think now the purges in Wisconsin are getting a lot of attention, but like, the reality is that Republicans purge voters all the time, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally, and that's really scary. You know, if you get purged from the voter file and you show up on election day and you're just not on the system, that happens all the time. It wouldn't even be a news story. You know, like one, this isn't a this is an apocryphal story. You know, it's only I wasn't around in 08 for the Obama campaign, but someone who was told me a story about how uh, there was a county in Florida where the sheriff just flat out purged all the black people from the voter file, and you know because. Uh, because the Democrats were like constantly analyzing it, they were able to catch it, they were able to get the arm. There are a lot of Democratic lawyers, it turns out. They were able to come in and sue. But like, there are entire organizations dedicated to doing this stuff. Uh, and those are the illegal purges. It turns out states have an enormous amount of uh, you know, leeway to do this. And it's a big issue. You know, like actually everyone talks about the butterfly ballot, but the single biggest reason, uh, like basically why we lost in 2000, was the state of Florida improperly purged uh, 25,000 people for not being citizens who were actually citizens. Uh, and they weren't able to vote, and we lost by 500 votes. So that's, that's really scary. It's, uh, it's hard to know what to do. You know, the reality is that Republicans control the courts, and so there's, sometimes you can stop things, sometimes you can't. But there is like a pretty, you know, there's a small army of people, you know, both in tech, database administrators, lawyers, who are trying to work on this stuff. Actually, the DNC uh, has been really good at this in the last couple of years. Have you ever mapped it out? Um, oh, uh, yeah, I can talk to you after. There's some, there's some there. Can you repeat the question? Okay, um, So is, is there any difference uh, between uh, these general, uh, this general data uh, on which issues uh, are the best and uh, which ones are the best in swing states, or um, you know, which which ones uh, maybe work best together? What what the covariance of? Yeah, two, two things there. You know, the first um, is it's you know some messages do better in swing states and not, and it's just worth stepping back and wondering why that would be. Uh, and the answer is that we have a really horrible electoral system. Uh, so if you look at the, the presidential swing states this year, uh, you know, they're substantially less Latinx or uh, Asian. You know, if you look at the country overall, about 12, 13% of the electorate is Hispanic. And when you drill down to these swing states, that number goes down to 2%. Meanwhile, they're substanti they have substantially higher levels of non-college educated whites. Uh, and so this means that, you know, because of the way democracy works, uh, the issues that Hispanic voters might want uh, get penalized, and the things that uh, the things that non-college educated whites care about, you know, get weighted up more. You know, for example, immigration is like relatively unpopular nationwide, but when you go into the swing states, it becomes like pretty politically toxic, and this is like a big consequence, unfortunately, of having a political system that disenfranchises Hispanic voters. It's really bad. Oh, uh, and the covariance. That's a good question. Not to get too nerdy, but it turns out that. 
uh, it makes, you want issues that resonate together. You know, we came into it saying, oh, maybe if you had two healthcare issues, they'd have a bad interaction, but it makes sense to have one message or two messages that are similar and resonant. Uh, it's one reason why, you know, some, you know, there are a lot of populist candidates who kind of hammer on one thing again and again, and there's a lot of benefits to that. Thank you. Um, hi, Amanda Mohart, Democrats. Don't don't hold the mic in front of the speaker. Okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, as global communications chair, a lot of what you said here has resonated. Uh, in particular, a lot of the messaging that we have can resonate with our audiences. Um, and one thing that I see a lot that goes into the idea of voter disenfranchisement at the ballot box is just voter disenfranchisement by sentiment. And so I'm wondering um, what it is that, that you found in terms of people who are concerned that they're, not, not just that their, their vote doesn't count, but doesn't matter, but that my vote won't be counted or my vote will be tossed out and uh, there's, there's no point in going, going through that whole process because it's always money and, and it's an effort. Yeah, I mean, the biggest, uh, the single biggest thing, uh, you know, people do experiments on how do you mobilize people and how do you motivate people to vote, and usually the single biggest one is just help, for, you know, is to say your vote really matters, uh, your, uh, this election's gonna be really close. Uh, I think there's, it's important, you know, remember, even, even when there is all of this rigging that close elections happen all the time, control of the House of Delegates came down to one vote, uh, there's a bunch of other examples like that. I do think on the broader, demotivation question. This is something that you know Democrats have to be really careful of. You know, we did a big set of get out the vote experiments in Alabama, and something that was really surprising. You know, we were trying. We did a big African American mobilization uh, campaign, and that election actually saw the highest African American share of the electorate. You know, going back to Reconstruction, and you know, one of the things we found going into it, there was a, there was a big push. People really wanted to create this anti-Trump campaign, and it turns out that. You know, the kind of messaging, the kind of hard anti-Trump messaging that appeals to people like us and fires people like us out can be really demotivating, you know, to sporadic voters and particularly sporadic voters of color. You know, this is something we've seen again and again, is that hammering on about how biased the system is, about how hopeless things are, about how, you know, how bad Donald Trump is, actually can be pretty demotivating, but what does work really well is talking to people about school, talking to people about jobs. You know, I think there's actually like a real, people talk about persuasion versus mobilization, and I think something that's been really interesting is that we haven't really seen that kind of uh, trade-off. You know, the same messages that, you know, can get non-college educated whites to vote for us, you know, talking about concrete issues that help people, you know, concrete things and policies that help people, are the same policies that can motivate you know, African American and Hispanic voters and young voters. Uh, so that's, that's a real thing though, is we have to be really careful that we don't suppress our own voters uh, by being too, too cynical or too angry. And it's a, it's a, real, it's a real point, it's something I struggle with. Uh, for those people who would like to ask questions, if you could come like, Just over here and I can get the mic to you better. Hi, thanks. I just wonder, with all the stuff you're saying, are the campaigns listening to you? Do you have a feeling that, that most of them, I mean, it feels like the campaigns aren't beating on Trump when I feel like they should be, but maybe this is why. Yeah, I mean, I think in the Democratic Party, people, there was a lot of soul searching after 2016. You know, clearly, uh, you know, the strategy that they just did didn't work. People wanted to do something different. But more importantly than that, you know, the battlegrounds of 2018 were fought in like West Virginia and Montana uh, and, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin. And so there was uh, a lot of, internally, it wasn't just us, but there was a lot of testing, there was a lot of meetings. And I think that there was a consensus that, you know, instead of going full in on Russia or on Trump, and we should talk about healthcare. And you know, the reason is that, you know, roughly speaking, if the election is about healthcare, then the more the election is about healthcare, the more like 2012, you know, our election results will be. And the more it's about the kind of stuff that makes us really mad, the more 2016 will be. 2016 was bad. So uh, that's, I, I think that campaigns have done a really good job with that. You know, I think 
Uh, if you look back at, uh, if you categorize what percentage of ads in 2018 were about healthcare, it was something ridiculous, like 70%. And something that's really funny about that whole strategy was Republicans looked at it and said, oh, we have to cut a bunch of ads saying that we, you know, uh, support, you know, supporting uh, pre-existing pre conditions. And it turned out that, you know, the link between healthcare and making people vote for Democrats is so strong that we found that oftentimes when they ran ads about healthcare, it made people more likely to vote for Democrats. And so it was a great, it, it was a great strategy. I think, you know, going into 2020, there are a lot of, there are a lot of primary dynamics, you know, uh, that make things a little more complicated. But I, I actually think, if you look at our candidates, this has been the most issue-driven primary in a really long time, you know, on both sides, even with the moderate and the progressive candidates. Uh, thank you for doing this. I, I love the how deep in knowledge it's gone into. How do you apply swarm theory to any of this to see, looking at social media, where things are going to? Swarm theory. It's a thing. Yeah, so a big thing, there's two sides of this. You know, uh, there's the literal social media question. And so when we're testing ads, you know, we don't just look at how well this ad does, but also how likely people are to share it. Uh, you know, there's, it, there's an interesting matrix. You know, the problem with like the Mirrors ad uh, that Hillary Clinton made is that people really wanted to share it, but it also made people vote for Republicans, and that's really bad. But virality, if you have an ad that's good, is, is really important. And so we absolutely, you know, we, in our, in our experiments, we have a rough sense of how many followers people have and what their social graph, look, graph looks like and, you know, how likely people are to share it. And that's something we look at. I think when it comes to the relational organizing aspect, you know, the app I had, the creepy vote with me app, you know, when we're in a world where we can kind of see these social graphs, uh, there's like, this hasn't been explored too much, but there's a lot of really exciting things you can do, where for the first time, you know, you can in a non-bullshit way actually find, you know, micro-influencers and who actually knows a lot of get out the vote targets and who doesn't. And that's, that's like the big frontier. Like, as I said before, like figuring out how to harness networks is like the big open question in our field. There's a lot of really cool, smart people working on it. Okay, two more questions. I'll take this one. Oh, seriously. <laughs> I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, but I'm wondering if this applies mostly to just video-based ads that you would see on TV, Instagram, Facebook, etc. And if you've also looked at more um, static ads like memes or just images and whatnot, what works there as well? Because we can use that. Memes are great. So, uh, just letting, <laughs> let, letting you know. Um, you know, the other, you know, the fun thing is that uh, the big thing for us, you know, video ads, they're important. You know, you, you put something on TV, you should, you should know before you spend a million dollars whether it helps you. Uh, but the big thing for us, actually, and the biggest use case for our tool is people testing content and frames. Uh, you know, like, we can, people will put paragraphs of text and, you know, you can go and test. I think the memes thing is really interesting. Um, you know, it just turns out that the way that it's really hard, most people are really good at tuning out uh, advertisements, just even subconsciously, their brains, when something looks like an ad, uh, they just like tune it out. And that's actually something Donald Trump does really well relative to us, is if you ever look at his ads, and you shouldn't, they're, they're horrible. Um, I, I, I have, the greater good. Uh, it's something you can see is that they're awful. They look like they're made in Windows Movie Maker. You know, it looks like the font is shitty and jumps around. And uh, it turns out that actually those ads are pretty good um, because people, it kind of tricks people's brains into not ignoring it. And so, you know, one of the best ads that I've, you know, people don't realize how expensive making ads can be. You know, there was this really famous ad maker who uh, had an anti-Trump ad that involved literally driving a, a car off a cliff. And so they spent like $500,000 or something ridiculous on the ad, and it turned out that it didn't work, so that was bad. At the same time, the most effective ad that I've ever tested was this ad, this $2,500 ad made by a guy named Frank. Uh, and it was actually very effective, it had a lot of flashing gifs. And, so anyway, um, it turns out that polish isn't as important as people think, and actually sometimes it can be a negative just because people are trained to ignore stuff that looks too much like a traditional ad. 
Uh, yeah, so you know these were all these were all video ads, but we have actually tested you know tons of static images, and yeah, we've seen there's like two two things I'd say you know when it comes to is that one uh, graphs are, are bad actually you know I, I, I like graphs a lot my whole talk's just been graphs but <laughs> persuadable voters don't like graphs so that's like some advice I'd give uh, but otherwise memes are really good you know it's, I think if you look at successful candidacies you'll uh, I think like something that I like to say and. You know, if there are any field organizers here looking mad at me, is it turns out yard signs are actually really good. It took us a really long time to test, but yard signs are incredible, and memes are the yard signs of our era, so uh, very pro memes. For last question. I also agree that memes are really good. <laughs> Especially if they're dank. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, in relation to people of color who vote, um, I don't actually, I don't do graphs, because, man. Um, I kind of just do by uh, what I feel in, in the community. Um, I feel like over the past 15 years that I have been in the community of people of color, I noticed a growing trend of um, cynicism and opposition to the act of voting or becoming politically involved. Am I correct in this assumption? I need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, I think it's definitely true that uh, not turnout among uh, Latinx voters specifically has been declining actually for the last like 40 years. If you go and you look at uh, if you look at census data, some of that is demographic, you know, uh, the nature of the community has changed in some way, um, but uh, it's, you know, definitely, obviously when it comes to, uh, you know, African American voters, turnout was very high in the Obama era and it's been falling since then, um, but I think there's like a real point where the Democratic Party, a lot of you know, democratic institutions are kind of catered toward the the views and interests of liberal white people because they're the people who, you know, provide the money and uh, and so that's like a that is a real issue. <laughs> it's really it's not great because uh, you know you can't actually. Uh, I, I think you see this. People are when they look at the when they look at the democratic primary. Uh, I, I think you can. There's a lot of polling that surprised people, and I think it's, it's had to do with certain you know certain communities not paying attention to those things. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, uh, Latinx turnout has been declining pretty steadily for the last like 40 years, and that's a really big deal. Like if you look at Texas, I think something like 67% of 18 year olds in Texas aren't white, but if you look at people who actually voted in 2016, a majority of them are white. And if we're ever gonna win, you know, the Sun Belt, that's something we have to change. So. Does she, have, does she have a second question, so I'll let that one slip through? <laughs> I'm just going to waste more of your time. Um, the last question. Um, yeah. Dreamers uh, facing backlash. Um, what's up with that? Explain. Um, is this for like swing voters? Or is it? Swing states. Okay. Because I was like, whoa. You guys have some explaining to do. <laughs> okay. That, that's it. So David, thank you very much for that talk. I'm sure that everyone got something out of that. We did. And um, uh, before the night is over, we still have the silent auction to do. And I'm going to go ahead and get the slides. So this is me. And um, where is Emily?